Hello and welcome to the next Fly Dojo video. Today we're going to be doing a A320 startup and kind of preparation guide. I've seen a lot of uh, startup guides made by simmers and I think a lot of them are really, really good. I think most of the people get the general steps uh, that we're supposed to use getting this thing ready. But I did want to just give people the opportunity to be 100% immersed and to see how at least my air carrier handles getting the Airbus all strapped up and ready to go. So without further ado, let's get started. For me, when I walk out to the Airbus, the preparation actually starts before I even sit down into the flight deck. As I'm approaching on the jet bridge, I'm looking for a few things. One thing I'm looking for is that the gear doors are closed. If maintenance has come out and opened the gear doors, we want to make sure that we're cognizant of that. That's just something our carrier is very, wants us to be very aware about. We also want to make sure that the APU area is clear. There's not a maintenance technician back there working around the APU outlet uh, that might be injured if we just go ahead and start up the APU. And then we also want to make sure, this is very important, that we're chalked and in place. This is going to be very important later because we're going to depend on the ground crew to pull those chalks because we're actually going to have, I've seen a couple startup videos talk about not removing their parking brake until the tug is in place. Well, in real life, we're chalked and in place. And before we even give them permission to begin pushing at all or even getting near the aircraft, we're going to have that parking brake off. Alright, so the, once we have that, we call that the GAC check. That's gear, APU, and chocks. That's going to be done. We're going to come into the flight deck, and we're going to go ahead and do what we call the 333 check. That's going to be three documents. We need an airworthiness certificate, a registration, and a radio station permit. We need three maintenance checks. We need to make sure that we have our minimum equipment list, the uh, RON check, the remain overnight check, and the three-day check. One of those has been done. And we need to have three maintenance logbooks on board the aircraft. The previous one, the current maintenance logbook, and a spare in case something happens to ours. After that stuff's done, after we've done the 333 check, we can go ahead and move on to the very first flow. Now, if you don't know what a flow is in the airlines, we actually don't use checklists as you do when you're learning to fly. When you're learning to fly, you do checklists in a read and do fashion. So you pick up the checklist, you read the item, you do the item, therefore it's called read and do. And the airlines, to save time, we do flows. So you come in and you do a set of moves from memory and then later verify by performing the checklist. So in that sense, you will start here with the preliminary flow. That's going to be the first officer's flow, or usually we're calling it now uh, the first flight crew member to arrive at the aircraft flow. But we'll just run right through it here. So the first step is we want to walk come to the engine panel and make sure the engine master switches are off and that the engine mode selector is in normal. Then we'll move here to the weather panel. I wish the glare was a little out of the way. There we go. And we'll make sure that the system is in the off, that the radar is not on. It can be a hazard for those on the ground. And so we want to ensure that the radar panel is off and the radar is not currently working. Moving on, we go to the gear handle. We want to make sure that the gear handle is in the down position that it is not going to inadvertently deploy. There are se several safety features in place that would ensure this not happen, but we do double check that the gear handle is down. Moving in there, we move up to the wipers, making sure that the wipers are both in the off position. And finally, we make our way over to the electrics panel where we, work we will turn on the batteries. And you can see here that we actually have a problem already, if we're being 100% realistic, that the batteries are actually at a lower voltage than we need, uh, that, that is required to start the APU. We need 25.5 volts, and in this case we have 25.4 volts. So that's not going to work for us. This is actually going to not be enough voltage to close the line contactor and start the APU, even if I tried. I'm sure it would work in this simulation, but in real life this would not be adequate. I've actually encountered this in real life. But luckily for us, right, that's not that big of an issue because we have external power. So we can go ahead and get external power on. And you'll see that the batteries should, we'll just make sure, enter a charging cycle, which should take about 20 minutes to get them up to a decent voltage. Moving on, we'll move to the APU test. Now, in this case, we're not going to be using the APU because we don't have the proper voltage, but we need to make sure that the APU is working. Now, this isn't implemented, but you're going to get five indications in real life of the APU when you press this button. You're going to get a continuous repetitive chide, kind of a ding, 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 your fire alarm. You're going to get the fire switch itself is going to light up. You will get an ECAM warning that an APU fire is happening, a master warning, and what else is there? CRC 2, 3, 4, missing 1, 
I believe it's the uh, hmm. maybe the, I think it might be the squib five indications. The squib light comes on as well, so that's your five indications uh, for the APU fire test push button. Now, all the five indications won't happen unless you have AC power on the aircraft, but we do in this case, right, because we have external power on. So APU is up and online. Moving from the APU, we'll come back down here to the integral light panel. Make sure the lights are where we want to set them. The APU pack flow is where we want it. We'll go ahead and take a look at the ventilation panel. Make sure that there we don't have any issues with the avionics cooling system. The blower and the extract fan here need to be not faulted. We want to make sure that these this system is working normally. We'll do come down here to the SD panel, and we're going to do normally a couple of system checks. I call this the R. -O this is how I remember it: R O H E, the R O H E check, and that's going to stand for the recall push button. We're going to make sure that whoever flew this last didn't have any failures they didn't tell us about, so that should recall any ECAM issues. It came up on the flight before this. We're going to ensure that we have enough oxygen, which would be, if I can get this to actually work. See, I can't ever. Normally, this is going to be on the a different page. But um, we're going to make sure that the oxygen is adequate. We don't have a orange bar underneath the oxygen. We're going to go to our, our hydraulics page in operative suite uh, and make sure that on the hydraulics page we have the, gre the green, blue, and yellow system all have an adequate reservoir quantity, and the uh, there's no need to fill or service those now. Um, and then as well, you need to check that the engine, which we can check, has enough oil. Now, in this case, uh, we're showing that we have 25 quarts, so we're definitely good to go. For the, um, I believe this is the NEO, so it's 14 quarts required for takeoff, and then if you're minus 30, it's 16.5 uh, quarts. So in this case, we have plenty of oil for the Neo engines, the Pratt & Whitney's. I think these ones technically have the leaps on it, but all I know are the Pratt & Whitney engines, so we're moving on from there. So moving on from this panel, we're going to work our way down, and it's kind of weird to do this backwards because I'm normally sitting in this seat. But we will check that the uh, flaps are currently matching the uh, indication on the E engine warning display. So the flaps are up and the flaps are indicating up. The spoilers are retracted and are showing retracted. Uh, on the flight control page, which we can't look at, and uh, the uh, parking brake is set, right? So we're going to make sure that the parking brake is where we want it. In this case, we want it on uh, for now, and then we'll move up here to the yellow hydraulic system accumulator. Now, we'll get into another systems video about normal versus alternate braking, but when we have the parking brake on, we're in alternate braking, and we're using the yellow hydraulic system. So in that case, we're going to make sure that the accumulator pressure is in the green arc here, and then we have pressure on our brakes, and our parking brake is set. Moving on from there, we're going to do a couple things behind the seats here. We are going to make sure that we have all of the emergency safety equipment that we require for this flight. We are going to make sure that these circuit breakers have not popped. There are no circuit breakers that have popped inadvertently somehow. And we're going to check the rain repellent, make sure that we have enough rain repellent or we don't need service in that case for this system here. After that, me, as the first officer, I'm out of here. I'm walking outside, and I'm going to do my walk around, my pre-flight checklist on the outside of the aircraft. Okay, now while I'm outside doing the walk around, ensuring everything's looking good on the outside of the aircraft, the captain would be sitting down and doing his preliminary cockpit preparation and making sure that things are where they need to be in here. Now, in the future, I might do a video about what I'm looking for, if you guys are interested. Go ahead and leave a comment and ask if you would like to see that, um, what the pre-flight looks like from the exterior of the A320, what I'm looking for, and what all those probes, vents, uh, drain masts are actually for. But for now, if I'm the captain just taking my seat, putting my bag behind here, and uh, I'll go ahead and do my very first flow of the day. That's going to include coming in here. And a lot of these switches, again, guys, are not going to be implemented yet, but I'm sure when we get uh, another version of the A320, this stuff will be implemented and all these buttons will be press pressable. So uh, don't fret. This is still grid information. I'm sure it'll be applicable to you in this simulator soon. So coming in here, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to come up here to the oxygen panel and we're going to make sure the crew supply switch is engaged. That's going to make sure that the oxygen masks that for the crew are receiving oxygen and actually usable, which is good. We'll move up here and we'll ensure that the ground control button has been pressed so the pre-flight activities of the air crew 
are being recorded for the cockpit by voice recorder and then we would press the CVR test button ensuring that the parking brake is on and that the loudspeaker is about in the 12 o'clock position here. After that we should get a chime, you should get like a tone and then we'll, be in, we'll know that the CVR is working. We'll move up here to the evacuation panel and we will move this into the captain position. That way the captain is the final authority on whether or not the evacuation can be commanded. Then we'll move up to the aiders panel. When we arrive at the aiders panel, we just want to make sure that we begin the full alignment of the aiders system. The gyros have to do an initialization that takes about 10 minutes. So we're going to go ahead and make sure that we have these aiders powered up. Now the big one we're looking for when we get to this panel is that the on battery light comes on as we engage these various units. That's going to make sure that our emergency battery backup lines have are successfully connected. And then in the event we did lose all of our external power, uh, we would have battery power to these for some time. Fun fact, trivia of the day, if you leave these engaged um, without external power to the aircraft and they're running on batteries on the ground, I believe they will, you, uh, there'll actually be a siren, like a little like horn going off, like an ee And so if you ever approach an Airbus that was left in nav because a crew swap was gonna happen and somehow the external power fell off the airplane, then this, this actually will sound an alarm after a few minutes. So that's kind of fun fact. Anyways, so we're gonna do these one, two, and three. Now typically, you know, it's how, it's how anal you wanna be. A lot of guys go left, left to right. Uh, we are trained to do one, two, and three. So it's uh, you go from off to nav, off to nav over here, and then in the center after that. So one, two, and three. That's going to take 10 minutes. But all we do here, boom, looking for on bat light, boom, looking for on bat light, and then boom, looking for the on bat light. Then we move down as the captain to the lights panel. We're going to put the strobes in auto. This is actually a two-part switch. It's not really, uh, seems to be implemented here with one and two. And we set it to one or two depending on who will be flying that day. So let's say the captain's flying, it'll be in the number one position. Then we'll move over here. We will go ahead and ensure that the seatbelt sign's on. We are in auto for no smoking lights and the emergency ex exit lights are armed. On this panel here, excuse me. We'll move up to the landing elevation panel here and make sure that it is in the auto position that's going to let the flight management guidance computer determine the pressurization schedule of the airplane and what pressure it needs to be at as we depressurize on the ground. If there's a mismatch between the database and reality, you might get a little bit of a whoosh as the outflow valve opens uh, when we touch down at the destination airport. So make sure that's in the auto. If it's not in the auto, uh, you might have a surprise on the ground where you're going. Then we'll move up here and we'll look at the pack flow. Again, the captain will decide based on how many passengers we have that day, what we want for pack flow. So if the APU packs were on, we could, well, if the APU's on, it's set to high, but if once the engines are taking over the bleed load, the pack flow is actually controllable. And in that case, you may want to change how much output you've got. But typically we're gonna leave it in normal. We're gonna leave these here. I don't really remember what temperature these uh, 12 o'clock position. I think, I wanna say it's, someone might be able to double check me. I wanna say it's 70, like two or 74 degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't really remember, but anyways. Typically, we don't mess with these too bad. If the captain might tweak them just a little bit. Then we'll move up to the electrics panel, just from this pre-flight. Again, this is the captain's preliminary cockpit check kind of flow. And uh, we will do a battery test. So he will power these off back on again to ensure that they're charging. And uh, just making sure and see that they're not even charging at all. So in this case, when he does the check, knowing that they've been on charging for a few minutes, uh, they'd, they'd be no good. We'd be calling maintenance. But... And this is a simulation, so we're good. Now for the fuel pumps, we actually do not engage the fuel pumps until the fueling process is complete. So back there, all over the right wing, is the fuel port. The fueler will be actually doing the fueling. And once that fueling section is complete, we'll do two things. One, we'll finally turn on the seatbelt sign to, to indicate that we are fueled. That's kind of a mental note. And we will turn these fuel pumps on. But today we're going to say that we're fueled, ready to go and we're gonna turn the fuel pumps on. But just know that this might get skipped in real life if the fueling process was not completed yet. Then we'll move up here to the fire panel. We will be doing a test on fire for the engine number one. There are seven indications for this fire test. The two squibs, the light, the CRC, the master warrant, the ECAM, and the pedestal light here. So again, that's gonna be these lights, the continuous repetitive chime, you're gonna get the master warning indication here, the ECAM warning here, and 
LED warning here next to the engine switch rheostat. So we'll get seven indications there, ensure that's working. We'll mirror that, do seven indications here, make sure that's working. Then we'll come up here kind of weirdly to the audio switching panel. And again, these flows come from Airbus themselves. I think there's some variation between air carriers, but I think for the most part, we're, we're our carrier has kind of switched over to a pretty standardized Airbus type of flow. So this you might see a lot of similarity in other real Airbuses. Um, we'll move to the audio switching panel. We'll just make sure that the audio switching panel is in normal. That's typically, I believe, where we're going to have it. And we'll move back down here to cargo heat. Now, this Airbus does not have cargo heat. But uh, we'll just, since we're here, we'll double check the ventilation panel. And we'll move up to audio control panel 3. We'll want to have that on in real life. And we'll want to have the uh, passenger announcement um, pull, like the to pull it to listen on so the CVR can actually listen to the flight attendant's announcements that they're making in the back. Finally, we'll move up here. We'll check the, uh, the maintenance panel to make sure that nothing is selected inadvertently up here. Then the captain will come down here to the glare shield. Actually, excuse me. He'll move down here to the standby attitude indicator, set the barometric pressure here, which doesn't seem to be indicating what the setting is, but okay. I'm going to say it's 2992. We'll move over here, sure that the clock is in the GPS button and the anti-skid is actually on. Then we'll kind of move down here. And depending on who's flying at this point, you may see the captain do the uh, diff strip, which we'll talk about, uh, programming the flight management guidance computer, or he might just glance over that and verify what's going to happen later. He might skip that if he's not going to be the pilot flying. Then we'll move down here, and it's a pretty common sense flow from this point on. You're going to move down. Radio control panel needs to be set to the radio frequencies that you're going to be using. Typically, we're going to have ground and tower in one, and we're going to have ramp and uh, maybe company in number two. So the company frequency and then the ramp controller in two. So he's going to set this up probably for ground and tower. He'll s uh, set his ACP, his audio control panel, for listening on VHF-1 and VHF-2. Intercom will be off at this point because we don't want the ground cr crew to hear our conversation. Um, typically just like to keep things private. The weather, he's going to double check uh, that the weather radar is off. Switching panel is normal. Um, moving through here that the thrust levers are at idle that the master switches are off, parking brakes where we want it, the emergency gear extension is stowed, and then he'll double check the transponder and my work over here just to make sure that my uh, radio control panel and audio control panel are both normal. Then he'll do his flow, uh, which includes uh, this, the next flow after this, which includes kind of getting the flight control panel where we want it. We keep leave it in arc typically, and uh, usually, you know, 10 degrees, 20 degrees to start, and we'll want to make sure, this is the big one, that the um, flight management guidance computer is on and reading. We want to see dashes in these indications that mean that the 1FD2 is indicated here. Uh, if you see something off like this, you might see something like this, which is not what you want. That means that the uh, flight, the FMGC is not on and engaged properly. So we want to see two dashes and we want to see all, all dashes here. We want to see 1FD2, all dashes. Uh, after that, he will do uh, just a quick look at the PFD ND, make sure that the compass indication makes sense. Our position is starting to make sense here. He'll set his brightnesses to something he wants to see, his loudspeaker to that, and uh, do an oxygen mask test as well to ensure that the oxygen mask is working. That is the conclusion of the captain's preliminary cockpit checklist and flow. Now, at this point, we wouldn't actually have done any checklists at all. These are all just housekeeping things that we need to have done before the first checklist actually happens. Okay, so now I'm probably coming back in from my walk around to ensure the exterior of the airplane is normal. Nine times out of ten, it is normal, and there are no maintenance issues to be had, so I would report that to the captain. And I would take my seat over here and begin doing pretty much a similar flow that you saw with the captain's kind of glare shear flow, glare shield flow, excuse me. So I'm going to ensure that the flight directors uh, are on, I'm in constraints, I'm in arc, I'm at 20 degrees, making sure this is good. Double checking kind of my work here, we're moving down, I would begin the diff strip, so we'd actually program a route into the computer. Uh, I, there are some great videos, but that is the D-I-D-I-F-S-R-I-P, P, there's two P's, right? That stands for data. We want to come in here to the position monitor and make sure that the initialization was good. Excuse me. It starts out with air um, database. Excuse me. That's incorrect. 
So the first thing we do is we come and we check the database to ensure that the navigation database is up to date. And we want to make sure that the engines match and we're, we're our performance factor if we have one of those. Performance factor is kind of a factor that maintenance gives engines with a little bit of wear and tear on them. They're perfectly safe, but they do have a performance uh, mitigated performance compared to a brand new engine. So we do want to tell the flight management computer that that exists. So its predictions can be updated when it's navigating and, and doing its planning. So we're going to double check this stuff information here. That's the D in data. Then we're going to come here and we're going to program our route. So today we're in Fort Lauderdale. Let's say we're going to Dallas and our fuel is going to be all, and some of this stuff isn't implemented all the way. So it might be a little weird, but we are going to just enter uh, Fort Lauderdale to Dallas in our flight plan. And this is the init A feature. So it's data init A. And a couple other things we want to make sure that uh, it, it'll, pro uh, it'll suggest a cruise altitude, to, um, but typically we get assigned one. So you might see me do something like flight level 340, and then we'll get actually the correct temperature. So minus, let's say it's 47 up there. Okay. And then we'll also get the tropopause height. Uh, this is not a meteorology video, so I'm not going to discuss tropopause, but it is a feature of the atmosphere that the computer wants to know about. You can look it up. Uh, so that's DI. And that's pretty much it for this page. We just want to make sure we get our cruise flight. Uh, our cost index, excuse me, that also needs to be entered. That's going to tell uh, how aggressive we want to burn fuel on the way to our destination. And then, if again, if we had any alternate here, uh, we would enter the alternate uh, in this area. So let's say we have uh, Houston as an alternate today. We'll put that in there. And that's going to update our fuel planning as well. So Houston's our alternate. Um, and then we'll deal with that later. And then we would also enter the flight number for the ADSB information here. So let's say we were somebody, I don't know, MM101. Let's say that for some reason that's our call sign. So we put that there. Now the ADSB information matches. Uh, and then this is all good. So that's init A. So data, check the database, init A, D I, F, which is flight plan. Now it's populated from the init A, my departure and destination airports. So we need to fill in the difference here. You can see that if you go to the ND, and we, I don't know if this works, but if you go to the plan page, it's how we verify where we're going. And I step through the legs, is how we say it, the arrows. You can see that if I come out quite large on the range, it's going to pretty much warp us to Fort Lauderdale, right? There's nothing between the two airports. It's like, hey, you, ac you don't actually have a flight plan in here. So we want to make sure that we actually put one. Now, I didn't go to the trouble for this video to like plan out what I would typically do in a route, but we I have some good ideas. Uh, typically, we'll take off, uh, let's see, where, where I park, uh, we take off 10 right most often, just down there. So we'll do 10 right, and uh, I've done the arcs and the beach. I've done all these. So let's just say we're doing the arcs for. So we'll insert the SID, the standard instrument departure, and the runway of departure for the guidance computer. And then I come down here to the arrival, and I set my arrival next, and then I connect them with the intermediate fixes. So... Uh, let's say we're going to be landing uh, runway 17 center via the, let's do, is they, do they have the Leatherneck? What is it called? Maybe that's a fix. I'm trying to remember what it's called. There's one where like all the fixes are uh, like Marine Corps oriented and I can't remember the name of the arrival. Oh well, we'll do the Barry one. Novias. So we'll insert that. And that might look kind of funky because I might be like a, a Western arrival or whatever. So then we want to come down here and this display is a little funny. Uh, this doesn't look quite right. I think they need to keep working on just this uh, Honeywell software because it doesn't really match up 100%. But that's fine. Uh, we'll step through here and we'll look for the disco because there's going to be one a discontinuity in our route. So there's the departure. And I guess it didn't build a discontinuity. So it's going to connect the last fix of our departure, our SID, to the first fix of our star. Which for me today, that's okay. Uh, because again, this is not going to be, we're just trying to get you guys to the uh, edge of the runway ready to go. So uh, for today, we're just going to call that good. But just know that there are intermediate fixes in here you would need to go fill in. VORs or jetways. And you can see that it's just connecting that here. So if I kind of zoom in to Lauderdale, there's the arcs for SID, right? It's going to take us out to arcs and it's just warping us all the way out to Dallas to start that Barry arrival, okay? So typically, this big, huge, you can probably see the range here. Two, well, whatever. That's weird, that display, I don't know. Okay, but anyway, you can see that the flight plan is a little funky, but that's how we would do it. So D, I, F, uh, and then we would come back to, I would change this back to arc. Excuse me, 
please go back to arc. Oh, that's interesting. This does not move with this in real life, but okay. Um, we go to secondary. Now, the secondary is looks identical to the init A page, okay? But it's a secondary flight plan. But wha what you do is you would program something like Fort Lauderdale to Fort Lauderdale. And the thing we would do is we would have an ILS built back into, let's say, our departure runways 10 right. We would build another ILS approach into 10 right in case we had an emergency on departure. We could suddenly switch, go into heading mode by selecting our heading, activate our secondary, and ask for vectors back to intercept the final approach for runway 10 right. So we could be back on the ground within five minutes of departing. That's kind of a safety feature, so that's what we use our secondary flight plan. And you'll see that once we have a good departure and there are no failures or anything, we'll, we'll go ahead and copy the active into the secondary as a backup active flight plan once we get through 10,000 feet. So um, that's the S. So D, I, F, S, R would be the RADNAV page. There's differences in opinion on what the RADNAV page can be used for in the pre-flight activities, but what I do for situational awareness is I just program a VOR in that's nearby. Uh, it doesn't like my doesn't like my VLR selection, but typically what we'll do is it will auto tune the nearest nav aid automatically, unless you tell it, I want you to look at this VOR and this VOR only. So I'll hard tune, quote unquote, a VOR into the RADNAV page, and then we will go back to the init B page. The init B page is our fuel planning information only before we start the engines. The init page, init B disappears after starting the engines. So in this case, we would have uh, on our paperwork from the company, the zero fuel weight and the zero fuel weight CG, we just want to make sure that those all match. We would have our block fuel, what we ordered in pounds from the fueler. We would verify that information. And then we would verify any information like alternate information, taxi information is typically like 0.4. Uh, and then the computer will eventually spit out a um, prediction of what we should be. And we'll match that with what the flight planner has just selected. And hopefully they come out pretty dang close. So that's kind of something you might expect. It's like 26.6 uh, aft datum and then 130.0 zero fuel weight, something like that, you know, just to kind of a guess here. Um, just to just so you guys can see it, I was hoping it would populate the whole thing, but it looks like it's not going to happen. So anyways, that's an it B. So D-I-F-S-R-I-P-P. -P. So Prague. Um, I, was, I was having trouble getting this work earlier, but what we program in here would be the uh, departure airport runway. So we're going to take off 10 right today. So in that case, we would put in 10 right right there, and it would give me DME, GPS DME information from 10 right at all times just for situational awareness. So that's what I would do at this page. And then the perf page, uh, this will not be automatically populated. So what we have here is some numbers. I don't know where these numbers came from, but these numbers would come from aero data through our actual RA cars, which is not implemented either. So we would get A cars information from a service whose job is to just run performance and weight and balance information, they would uplink that information to us and we would uplink that information to our guidance computer. So in this case, again, I don't know where these numbers came from, but we would see something, you know, if we had a full boat, we would see something like 140, which I can't even change them, but you'd see like 140, 140. You know, if you're really light and you're doing like a flaps two takeoff, you might see numbers these low, but that's really low. That's really low. Like that's a really light load. Uh, other, other things on this page, you're going to see that we'll tell the computer our flex temperature, uh, which I won't get into the, in the nuances of what that means, but we're telling the engines that we don't need uh, full thrust to take off. So we're just trying to save wear and tear on the engines by telling it it's hotter than it's outside. So it brings the thrust level down. Thrust level down. Uh, and then the, what flaps we're going to take off with. So flaps one. Oh, so that actually worked that time. So flex 45, we'll say, and then we'll tell it flaps one. Um, and then here you can set your transition altitude. Uh, where we would transition to from the 250 knot uh, departure restriction speed to full speed, I believe. And then the thrust reduction and acceleration altitude should be 1,000 and 1,000. Unless they're doing that via MSO. But still out here, it should be 1,000 and 1,000. Okay. So that's it. Uh, that's it for this part. That's the diff strip. I know that was a lot. That's quite. That's a whole lesson in and of itself. I mean, I mean, there's videos out there where this is just done uh, by itself. So just that's just a quick rundown of how I would program the guidance computer. And again, I would have a paper release that I'm comparing all that stuff to. But now that we're here, hopefully, it, I don't think it's going to let me do it. 
but uh, we would have the pilot flying, which we'll say in this case is going to be me, the captain, uh, would have the perf page selected, while the pilot monitoring would have the flight plan page selected. And to finish the flow, I would come down here, check my uh, radio control panel, uh, audio control panel, set my transponder code from my clearance. We'll say I got 5555, five, 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 uh, and make sure that the thing is set to on auto there. Uh, excuse me, actually, that doesn't happen yet. We just set the code. And that would be it. So now, so now, we, once we've got this uh, kind of this housekeeping stuff to get things ready, completed, we're going to come to another portion, kind of a mental note, where kind of a memory aid where we say talk, talk, checklist, APU. So we need to talk to the flight attendants. The flight attendants need to be briefed on the altitude we're going to, the flight time, uh, and route any possible turbulence and anything that they need to consider. That's their opportunity to kind of get introduced to the crew. And also, they can tell you at this point whether they're having trouble with any passengers or anything like that. That's the captain typically doing that. And then uh, the pilot flying, so the captain in this case, would do a departure briefing. So there's another memory aid uh, we use uh, for the departure briefing called PAWTAS, P-A-W-T-A-S. Uh, and that stands for pilot, who's the pilot flying, aircraft, which aircraft are we in? My air, my air carrier flies several variants of the Airbus, so we need to clarify the differences between those variances. The current weather, where we're departing. The taxi route we're going to use, so that's P-A-W-T. Uh, abnormals, so we'll do a kind of a uh, emergency briefing, which I'll, I'll cover here in a second. And then we'll talk about the the SID, so the standard instrument depart the departure that we're going to be using, so the SID. Um, so just a quick rundown, something like that would sound like, uh, okay, I'm the captain, I'll be the pilot flying today. The uh, aircraft we're in, where it's an A320neo, we're going to keep in mind all of the engine limitations for these new neo engines, and we'll make sure that we use uh, a dual cooling start. I'll just have the first officer select dual cooling just to keep those start times down. It looks like the lineup out there today uh, for departure is not very high. There's not a lot of people to look for and wait for. So we're just going to go ahead and start both engines here at the gate after we push instead of starting one on the way over there, just to get that out of the way. Um, as far as weather, it's beautiful, clear to a million, light winds out of the out of the east, so no nothing to be too worried about for the weather. Taxi route, uh, and this is where I would refer to my jet charts and talk about, okay, we're going to taxi 10 right. Honestly, you guys, I don't really know where I'm at, so this, is, this video is going to get interesting um, once we actually do push back, but... Um, I would, yeah, brief the taxi route where we're going to go, and then we would get to the runway. So I would say, okay, the t departure runway today in Fort Lauderdale is going to be runway 10 right. Uh, it's going to be, um, I would typically say, let me see if I can pull it up on my JEP charts here. Sorry. 10 right is going to be 8,000 feet long, and then we would go into our kind of memorized abnormal uh, script, which we always have in the back of our mind to make sure that if anything does go wrong on departure, uh, we are ready and prepared for it, right? So uh, the captain would say, runway 10 right is 8,000 feet long prior to B1. It'll be my decision to reject. I will bring the aircraft to a stop, put the parking brake on, and call for flight attendant stations. Then I'll analyze the situation and call for ECAM actions or the emergency evacuation checklist if required. Then he'll look at the FO expectantly, waiting for him to say his side of things. And the FO will say, I'll call your reversers and auto brakes or manual brakes. I'll inform air traffic control we're coming to a stop on the runway. And if required, I'll request emergency equipment. Then I'll turn the dome light off, then perform ECAM actions or the emergency evacuation checklist if required. Then the captain will kind of take back over and says, okay, after V1, which again, if you guys don't know what V1, that's our go, no go decision speed. We will continue. If we have an engine fire or failure, the single engine uh, departure, is going to be, in this case, in Fort Lauderdale off of 10 right, is straight out. So if we do have a single engine on departure, we're just going to be holding runway heading, getting up to 1,000 feet, and accelerating and cleaning things up before we continue the process. It we'll plan to land back here at Fort Lauderdale in that event. Uh, and if anything else, uh, any other type of failure that's not uh, so severe, we're just going to treat it uh, as an in-flight emergency and treat it uh, ad hoc as it comes. Uh, let's see. If, all, if, thing, if everything is normal, I think today we planned on departing on the... Uh, what do we say? The... What was the departure? The ARCS, f uh, ARCS 4 departure, and then we would brief the departure. So if you look at an ARCS 4, we would talk about the top altitude of that departure. Looks like the ARCS 4 is up to 3,000. So we'd make sure that we're set to 3,000 feet as the top. And 
looks like uh, as far and then we talk about constraints. So we need to make sure that the uh, c tone is uh, got an expect at eleven thousand here for a tone. So we don't. So you need to see that at or above eleven thousand for a tone is entered into the flight plan. So we need to have the constraint in there for a tone. And for some reason, yeah, this is going to really mess with people. It's bringing up the lateral page instead of the vertical page. Despite, am I crazy? Yeah, this is this is wrong. We're gonna. I'm, on, I'm not gonna have a meltdown on my brain with that because those pages are incorrect. But we would go ahead and enter uh, an add or above add a tone. So we could do plus, which that's not working. Great, terrific. Anyways, <laughs> oh my god, eleven thousand feet. At a tone. Now this should be at or above, but uh, you know I can't get it to give me a plus sign, so we're gonna say a tone at eleven thousand feet. Hopefully it takes that. And it's not gonna take that. Okay. Well, that constraint isn't verified in there, and I don't have any predictions by the M FMG season. So there is some work to be done, I think, for the FMG software. But we would make sure that the constraint on the departure is there. Um, all right. So that would be the briefing, and uh, then we would do the pre-flight checklist. Now, I won't give you the actual verbiage of the checklist that we do because those are, um, I believe I have signed an NDA, uh, those are considered sensitive information, uh, and I'm not allowed to share the actual checklist items. But we would essentially, I mean, it's pretty common sense, we would verify that we have done every step that we just did, right? So the checklist, we would come out, and we would quickly read through those items and verify that everything has been conducted a as uh, per standard operating procedures and that we are really ready and uh, ready to go. So after this, we will discuss the before engine start items, and we'll do a push and engine start. All right, and we're back. So we've done the pre-flight checklist that is complete. We are ready for our before start flows. At this time, we would make sure that all of the paperwork has been given to the gate agent. We would have a signed copy of the release given to her that we acknowledged it, and all of that stuff has taken place. The gate, uh, yeah, the customer service agent would be in the jet bridge waiting to pull back the gate. Uh, she would begin pulling back the gate, and then we would do these last-minute flow items, and then call ramp for a pushback. So I'll start with the first officers. Uh, I w mine's pretty simple. All I do is make sure the APU bleed is APU's on, and I did miss that. So we <laughs> I did do a classic blunder, which is that I get to talk and then don't remember to start the APU in time. So once that's up, up and on speed, we will turn on the bleeds. The window is closed, and the transponder is on, set to auto. The captain is going to prep for engine start by turning the beacon on. Is that even... Okay, that's an auto. Um, the beacon on. I think I worked through this on the flow and actually didn't do the switches. Sorry, guys. Um, I don't know. I just assumed everything is not implemented. There we go for that. So that available light on the APU is ensures that it's up and on speed and capable of producing a both electric and pneumatic power. So, um, yeah. So beacon's on for the captain. The nose wheel steering pin is indicated as disconnected, so we want to make sure that um, nose wheel steering is disconnected here. Uh, they can put a, a tow pin inside of the nose wheel, steer uh, nose wheel gear, and that's going to disable my nose wheel steering and make it safe for them to push me back, so it's free castering for the tug. So we want to verify as the captain that the amber nose wheel steering disconnect symbol is here. The doors are closed and the slides are armed. The accumulator pressure for the yellow system is good. The thrust levers are at idle, as well as the, um, we want to make sure that the doors uh, here have been tested and that they are closed. The parking brake is where we want it. In this case, we want it off because we're assuming we're chocked. Hopefully, I don't move and the thing does simulate that we are chocked. And we um, have our window closed as well. So again, that's beacon, nose wheel steering disconnect, doors, windows, accumulator pressure, thrust levers at idle, uh, parking brake, door check window check. Good to go there. And for the first officer, we have our bleeds on, doors closed, the transponder is on. So we are ready for pushback. This time, as the first officer, I go ahead and give ramp a call and say, ramp, this is so-and-so. We're at gate so-and-so, and we're ready to push. And they'd say, so-and-so, you're, you're clear to push. Tail to the, let's say in this case, we're facing south, so tail to the west. And I did realize just now that we are at right here at the departure end of 2-8, right? So for brevity's sake, I'm going to go ahead and change my departure runway to 28 right. That way, just make the video that much smoother, more smooth. 
And what that's going to mean, guys, is as I turn the airplane around, there's going to be several steps we do that would have done, we would have a lot of time to do if we were, uh, had a pretty high taxi time. But again, again, but what we would do in the event, event that we don't have that is just do them while we're parked, which I think is what we're going to do for this video. So without further ado, I think we are parking brake off and ready for push. So I'll press shift P. Hopefully this works. And I don't know if it works like it did in FSX, but hopefully I can press like two and that tells him a direction to push, hopefully. Here we go, here we go, so here's the pushback. Now, in real life, I would be doing, uh, he would command the first officer to begin the start sequence, okay? So in this case, I'd make sure that the bleed's on. He'd say, go ahead and give me a start on one. I'd say, all right, starting engine one. We turn this to start and engage one. Chrono would come on to time the start procedure, and we would begin starting that engine. I'm going to keep an eye on this push, just to ensure nothing goes crazy. And I don't know that he's actually going to turn me at all. It would be nice if they kept the key bindings kind of across so FXX guys could just seamlessly transition here. But as soon as he gets me decent where I can turn out uh, and not hit this truck, we'll be good. That's probably good. Hopefully he'll stop his push. Terrific. So at this point, the captain would say uh, push complete. Uh, so the crew would say push complete, set your brake. The captain would say, okay, brake is set. Show me the pin on the left, clear to disconnect. And th what he's saying is he wants to see that their tow pin is gone and removed from the airplane. That way he has nose wheel steering and that this orange symbol would be gone. Looks like at this time we're getting a good start on one. The big indication for me are two things that look like neither one of them are going to be, uh, I don't know, sh I, excuse me, I don't know anything about these leaps, okay? I don't know how they start or how this works, so I fly the Pratt & Whitney's, so. Here you go, you can hear that PTU going off. So it looks like we got a good start on one, I'm going to take it. So he would go ahead and say start engine number two, so starting engine two. So we'll sit here and be in people's way and wait on engine two. We're going to do just a quick, kind of quick brief for myself. We're going to do a right 180 out here, Tango 1 to Bravo 12, I believe, to a departure in runway 28 right. 28 right is 9,000 feet long. That should be Tango 1 there. Yes, for 28 right, departure right there. Perfect. So because we're so close, like I said, we're so close to where we're going to take the runway for departure, we're going to do a lot of housekeeping here in the airplane before we even call for a taxi, okay? We'll kind of go over that kind of some of that stuff. Okay, it looks like we're getting a good start on engine two. I can kind of still hear it roaring up there. Once it settles at 19.6, it looks like, we would call for the taxi check. We would have done the before start check uh, before we've done the push, but again, I'm not showing you guys the actual checklists because uh, I, th I don't think I can. So better safe than sorry. So that's good start on two. I'd say engine two start complete. Got to say taxi check, and we would do the taxi check. Pretty much taxi check. We're just going to verify the differences between the uh, yellow, and I would actually have a uh, flow after this. So once uh, the engine two is stable and before I, I call engine two start complete, I would actually do my flow. So I would do the APU bleed off, the APU off, I would come down here, and I would do the spoilers up and armed, set the flaps where they need to be set, if they would actually go, that's kind of curious here, there we go, set it, flaps to one, intercoms on, set the trim, check my uh, PFD, ND for information there, and sure that this is the yellow electric pump is off and then call engine to start complete also I would make sure I forgot a step sorry guys so it, it goes like this it goes APU bleed APU down here to spoilers I'm doing it backwards so I'm usually sitting over there so it's kind of messing with me rudder trim set to zero flaps set to the departure takeoff and intercom set the trim to your uh, aero data information come up here PFT ND check yellow electric pump check check. That's going to be typically for taxing with one engine, the yellow electric pump would be coming on. 
All right, so he would call for taxi checklist, and then we would do a we'd begin taxing. Now, this is where the differences start, because again, because we have a very short taxi, I as the captain am going to elect to do all of our housekeeping um, here at the ramp before we d we ask for taxi just for time's sake, because we're going to get really bunched up on time with that short taxi otherwise. So, what the captain would ask for me as the first officer now would be a mini brief is what we call it so he would take a look at the the uh, fmgc or i would if i'm doing the mini brief and i would go through uh what we just uh, a safety check for uh just a few things that we need to make sure and we verify before we take off so it is a memorized flow let's see if i can get it right and if the fmgc gets in my way i don't know so and this is why we go back to pilot flying is on perf and the pilot monitoring is on flight plan so i would say it's going to be a runway 28 right departure I would, well here's how I would start. I would say mini brief. Runway 28 right departure via the arc. See, and it's not displaying it here. Via the arcs for, sorry, 28. The runway. <laughs> I'm all sorts of screwed up. Excuse me. Okay, the mini brief would be. It's going to be a runway 28 right via the arcs for departure. Weight is 68.8 kilograms. That's really weird because we're doing pounds. Flaps. Config one plus F. Fuel 10.6. Uh, flex 45. That typically would display the flex here. Then I'd say, now I'm not getting my V speeds here, which should also be on the speed safe. You should be able to see them uh, above here. But you'd say, like, V1140, V2145, 3000 blue, first fix, cried. So uh, just to read it like I would read it in real life, it would be like, it's going to be runway 28 right with the arcs for departure, weight 148.5, flaps config 1 plus F, fuel 26.5, flex 45, V1142, V2145, 3000 blue, first fix, cried. He'd say, no questions, mini brief complete. After the mini brief is complete and both engines have been started, we can move into the flight control check. So he was going to say flight controls, and I'm going to get ready, and he's going to move through the flight controls. And the as you move the flight controls on the ground, the flight control SD page automatically populates this screen. So the flight control page, which isn't implemented, shows how the flight controls are moving in response to your inputs. So he goes through a check, and then I go through a check, and we talk about each step. So we go, I, I would say what I'm seeing on this page as he does it. So he brings the stick full back. I go full up, full down, neutral, full left, full right, neutral. Then he would press this pedals. If he's steering and taxiing, he'd press this disconnect so it doesn't actually um, move the aircraft with the rudder pedals. The nose wheel steering doesn't move. So he can deflect the rudders. Then he'd go rudders full right. Or sorry, full left, full right, neutral. Then I do exactly the same thing and just verify my own input. So I go full up, full down, neutral, full left, full right, neutral. Now, once that flight control check is complete, you move into the first officers before takeoff flow. So this plane does not have auto brakes. Or excuse me, this plane does not have brake fans, which would be indicated here. So that's the first thing you check. And then this would not automatically be on. This does not spawn on. So you'd go auto brakes check, auto brakes max. That's if we abort the takeoff, the plane applies maximum braking. Takeoff configuration check. So we would make sure that the plane is happy and uh, it likes how we're configured. Takeoff config. Come down here to predictive wind shear on. Uh, we would do the TARA functions on. And then I would press the PA switch to do an announcement and say flight attendants prepare for takeoff. So then we would get down to the end of the runway and we would begin the before takeoff checklist to the line and then again below the line. So in this case, we've done all our, we'll just keep it real. We've done all of our pre-flight checks. We've done all our housekeeping and now I'm ready to call for taxi. So I would say ramp, uh, so-and-so is ready for taxi. would say uh, so-and-so taxi and hold short runway tango or taxiway tango one contact ground control. So in that case, we're gonna do parking brake off. And first thing we do after parking brake comes off, clear left. First officer looks right, clear right. Want to make sure there's no traffic in the area, and we're going to go ahead and do a right 180. And I'm just turning on my head tracking here, and we're just going to see if we can follow the lines out and get just holding short here of Tango 1, I believe. Narrow. Okay, holding short of Tango 1, we're going to go ahead and give, first officer is going to give ground a call and say, 
Lauderdale ground, so-and-so is holding short Tango 1 ready taxi with information Mike, for example. And then the ground would say, okay, taxi hold short runway 2A right contact tower. All right. And I would read back that instruction. So-and-so is contact, uh, hold short 2A right contact tower. Go up here. And the captain would get any last minute things that he wants done, done at this point. So we're going to kind of go up here and hold short runway 2A right. And a couple things are going to happen. He's going to make sure if you want terrain on ND on, show you the terrain of the uh, environment, that's a good time to turn it on. Last minute things here, all tucked away. We're going to check final and contact tower. Tower uh, so-and-so is holding short runway 28 right, ready for departure. They'd say, okay, so-and-so, uh, line up and wait, runway 28 right. Say so lining up and wait, 28 right, so-and-so. I don't want to give away my call sign I use in real life. I keep finding myself tempted to tell you guys what it is. We're not going to do that. So we're going to line up and wait. As we take the runway, we're going to have the strobes come to on. All the top row, so strobes, beacons, wings, NAS logo, those all come on as we take the runway. So we're going to taxi into position here along the center line. Try to get a good line up. Not the best lineup in the world, but I'll take it. And we will hold in position. At this time, we want to make sure, just a last minute check, the takeoff config has been hit, but we want to make sure the Airbus has a no lights policy, right? So if you are doing everything right, you should not be able to look up and see anything on, right? Everything should be off. If something's on that's not supposed to be on, it's going to make a light, right? So we want to make sure that it's dark up here and that this is all green and looks good. There's no indications of anything here. Like, for example, if our parking brake was on, we could easily look up and say, oh, parking brake's on. That's no good, right? So we want to make sure that stuff's good, and we're just waiting for that departure. It might take 10 seconds. It might take two minutes. Uh, but then eventually the tower's going to come over and say, okay, so-and-so, uh, clear to take off runway 28 right. And we would say clear to take off 28 right. Fly runway heading, so-and-so. Okay, so for example, let's say they gave us a fly runway heading took us off our departure. We would turn on all these lights, all the way on. And we would begin our takeoff. So first thing you're gonna do is, just the last thing for this video, I know this isn't part of the startup, but this is just how we would do it, is you wanna hold your stick halfway down. There's gonna be a pitching moment as you apply power. So you wanna just apply a little bit of nose down uh, pitch. And we're gonna bring those, run those up to about 50% power. Just let those stabilize and then eventually go into flex. And today I'm gonna do toga, because we don't, I don't think it's reading my flex, but there's toga thrust. And now the first officer's waiting for the 80 knots call. We're coming down the center line. Eventually when we get to 80 knots, the first officer's gonna go 80 knots, thrust checked. And I'm gonna say check, and then I'm gonna bring my pitch to idle. Then he's gonna go V1, rotate. Rotating the aircraft, we're waiting for that positive rate call. Eventually, first officer is going to go positive rate. Gear up, gear up, and we're just going to fly into those flight director bars. So this time, I'd select heading because we got a runway heading assignment. So fly runway heading of 277. And we would stay in those flight directors so we don't overspeed the aircraft. Eventually, you get to 1,000 feet, it's going to want lever climb. So we'll go back to the climb detent. Staying with the flight director, it's going to want us to pitch down to ensure that we start to accelerate. That's our acceleration altitude. And at this time, it'd be a good time to go ahead and turn on. If we wanted to, you can play hand fly it. I've done that plenty of times, but you can turn on autopilot one. Eventually, we're going to reach our spoiler retraction fleet. We're going to say flap zero after takeoff check. Speed check, flap zero after takeoff check. The airplane will retract the first setting of flaps, the slats, and begin accelerating to 250 knots. There we are at 3,000 feet. Hopefully uh, they gave us a climb maintain to something higher at this point. So we'll set something like 12,000 feet. Now you can see alt star here. We want to set 12,000, tell the airplane to climb to uh, not an open descent. There we go, <laughs> climb at 250 knots to 12,000 feet. There we go. And then eventually, hopefully he would give me some sort of turn to like say direct to uh, Barry. So so-and-so uh, fly direct Barry and we would read back and begin our climb. This should go into nav mode automatically, but it's not going to, it looks like. 
and there we are. Heading off towards Barry and climbing to, let's say they just give us 35,000 or something. Just climb. There's no traffic out here today. They're just going to give us all the way up. We're going west, so it's probably going to be more like 34 instead of 35. There we go. Climb and 34. There's 34 blue, and that's it. So, other than that super sloppy takeoff, because I was hand flying and, and trying to narrate things at the same time, I hope you guys find this informative. I hope you guys find that this is kind of a, all of the steps that we would go through to actually fly the aircraft. The only thing that we didn't cover on the way out is the um, ACARS information. So that's going to be our little data um, radio unit that gets our information for takeoff and performance from uh, Aerodata. But that's it. That's exactly all of the housekeeping steps that we use for a normal departure in the Airbus A320. So I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you tune in for more videos. I hope you like and subscribe. And uh, thanks. I'll join you in the next one.